All right, we're going to start the chapter 7, 8 homework review. So this was a homework assignment that dealt with a little bit of topics at the end of chapter 7, mainly lattice energy, uh, as well as some of the earlier material in chapter 8 dealing with gas laws. Uh, so the average on this was a little bit higher than the last one, so that's good to see that we're picking things back up. The average was about a 9.8 out of 12, um, so not bad at all. Uh, there's a few things we want to go over, and not surprisingly, one of them is going to be lattice energy, so we'll start with that. Uh, so some of the questions that had the lowest success rates were these lattice energy problems, and it's understandable because there's a lot of steps here. Um, so for the first one, we want to calculate the lattice energy of the hypothetical ionic compound MX from the information below. So we're given IE1 for M, which is the ionization energy, 495 kilojoules per mole. We have this term here, metal solid going to metal gas, remember that in class we abbreviated that as delta H of sublimation. Now another thing I should point out is that a lot of the homework problems are set up as delta E because that's how the book has it in chapter 3. In reality these are delta H and um, in practice we should not worry about that distinction between delta H and delta E for this part. Uh, we're going to use the, the terms interchangeably. We call this in class sublimation enthalpy, delta H of sublimation. Here we have this term here which is M plus one half M2 goes to MX. We should recognize this as formation, delta E or delta H of formation. So this is forming the compound from its elements. We have X2 going to 2X. This is what we call dissociation. All right, so all of these uh, terms are given as, as delta E's, but we want to uh, relate them to delta H that we had as the terminology we use in class. And then finally, the electron affinity EA. So that's electron affinity for x going to x minus. So it's helpful to know what some of these terms mean before we start. Um, now one thing I'll give you now which which may be helpful is that for most lattice energy problems you can use a pretty general equation. So we're trying to find in just about all of these cases the lattice energy delta H lat as we abbreviated it. And then what we can do is we can write an equation that works for almost all cases, and I'll tell you which cases they don't work for here in a second. Um, it's going to be the delta H of formation, and then you're going to subtract a bunch of terms. So you have, um, now let me go back in time a little bit. So this is if the formula of your ionic compound is MMXN, where M is the metal, X is the nonmetal, and then M and N are the subscripts, which tell you how many of each of them there are in the formula. So the lattice energy for this is going to be delta H of formation, and then you have two terms dealing with the metal, M times the delta H of sublimation for the metal, and then M times the ionization energy for the metal. Okay, so those are the terms dealing with the metal, and then we're going to subtract N over 2 times the delta H of dissociation for x2, and then we're going to subtract n times, sorry, the electron affinity is how we're going to rewrite that. So this equation works in most cases. Now this is going to work in the situation where um, the nonmetal has a standard state of x2, which is going to be the case in most of them. But there are some variations to this, like sulfur, which is S8, and also where X2 exists as a gas. So as long as X2 is a standard state uh, that's a gas, we can use this equation. Um, now there's some additional terms we'll have to add. If, if X2 um, is a liquid or solid, so we're talking about Br2 or I2, which are liquids and solids, then we have to include minus n over 2 times the delta H of vaporization, which is the energy for going from the liquid or solid into the gas phase. So there's some variations here, but this equation here is going to work for most of them, and it would work in this case. So this is a helpful starting point, but I still think the best way to learn these problems is to draw out the born haber cycle and to understand all the steps that are involved. So remember for the born haber cycle, we're going to start with our ionic compound, which in this case is MX, solid. And then we're going to do a bunch of endothermic steps that are going to break up the ionic compound, and then we're going to 
try to get to this last step here where we're going to take the two ions m plus and x minus and recombine them to form mx and this is our lattice enthalpy delta h lattice and that's what we're going to be trying to find as we go around this cycle so the Bornhofer cycle always starts in the same way we're going to take the compound we're going to break it up into its elements so in this case it's going to be solid metal plus one half x2 gas. It has to be one half x2 to balance the equation because we only have one x in the formula. We go up here also and we see that we're not told anything about the state of x2. We have x2 is actually a gas in this term. Um, we're not told anything about the state of matter. So we'll assume that x2 is a gas because we're not told anything otherwise. And then from here in the born harbor cycle we're always going to have the same two steps next. We're going to take the metal into the gas phase. So the solid metal is going to become gas phase metal. We just haven't done anything to our non-metal yet. And then the next term is going to be ionization of the metal. So we lose an electron from the metal. And again, we haven't touched the non-metal, so still one half x2. So those two steps are always going to be the same. We break up, or those three steps really. We break up the compound into its elements in the first step. We break up the compound into uh, then we have to sublime the metal, make it a gas, and then we have to ionize it. So we should start writing in the terms here. So this is going to be our negative delta H of formation. This term here where we're going from metal solid to metal gas is going to be the ionization, sorry, the sublimation energy of the metal. Getting all mixed up today. And then this term here is going to be the ionization energy of the metal. So these three steps are always going to be the same for any lattice energy problem. The only difference is if you had two metals in your formula, you'd have to double the delta H sublimation, double the ionization energy, and so on. Um, so putting the numbers in from this problem, the delta H of formation is going to be this term here, minus 103.3. We're doing the negative of that, so it's going to be 103.3. Sublimation enthalpy is this one here, 66.5, all these are kilojoules per mole, and then finally the ionization energy, which is the first one here, is 495. So we'll start putting the numbers in as we go along. Now from here we have to take our non-metal half x2 and convert it into x minus uh, anion. So there's two steps that we do for that. The first one, which is always going to be endothermic, is going to be to dissociate this. So we still have M plus, we still have the electron, and then we're going to dissociate X2 into X, and that's going to leave us with just one X, because we're starting with half X2. So this is called delta H of dissociation, and we're actually going to multiply that by one half, because we only have one half X2. So we have this one half here for X2 as a coefficient, so it's going to be one half times the delta H of dissociation. All right, so don't forget those things there. So if we go to delta H dissociation is 184, so we're going to do one half times that, which is 92. And then finally, the last step is to take the electron and X and combine them to make X minus. Remember that this is called the electron affinity term, when we're adding an electron to a gas phase atom. We have one X, so we're going to use the electron affinity that's given to us without any modification. The electron affinity for X is minus 366 kilojoules. Now we'll notice that there's a term in this that we didn't use, and this is where some of the confusion came into play. We gave you the ionization energy for X, but we're not going to use that, and we're never going to use X as ionization energy, because ionization energy refers to losing an electron. X is our nonmetal, which is going to be gaining an electron, so we're never going to use its ionization energy, only the electron affinity. So we gave you a little bit of extra information here that you had to recognize not to use, so we're not going to use that term at all. All right, so our Bornhaber cycle is complete, and then remember the way we, we finish this is we take all these terms, add them up, and set them equal to zero. So since we're starting and ending at the same point, we have 103.3 plus 66.5 plus 495 plus 92, and then coming back on the other side, we have a minus 366 
and then we have our lattice energy delta H lattice equals zero. We solve for the lattice energy, and what do we get? minus 324.3 kilojoules per mole. Alright, sorry, I must have made a mistake on my calculator somewhere because that's not the right number. All the, all the equation was set up correctly, but this is going to be minus 390.8. So I must have misentered something there. Alright, so that's the correct answer for that one. Again, using the born haber cycle. If we wanted to use this equation up here, We can just put the numbers into the equation and see that it works. So delta H of formation is minus 103.3. Our, our compound is mx, so m is going to be 1. n is going to be 1 also. So we're going to have minus delta H of sublimation, which is 66.5. Minus 1 times the ionization energy, which is 495. Minus 1 half times dissociation energy, which is going to be 184. And then the negative of the electron affinity, which is, in this case, a negative number, minus 366. And so if we put all those in, we get this exact same set of numbers, which I'll verify that I did this correctly this time. And it also can go to minus 390.8. All right, so we can do this problem one of two ways. Um, I just warn you again, using this equation, it doesn't work 100% of the time, so you need to be aware of uh, the limitations of that equation. But the best way to do it is to set up this cycle. All right, let's do one more uh, just to see how this works. This one has a little bit of a, um, a, a different flavor to it. So here we're talking about the ionic compound M2X. So if it's M2X, we're going to have... When use the equation m equals 2, n equals 1. Um, but let's go ahead and draw the born haber cycle just because that's the better way to do it. Alright, so our born haber cycle is starting and ending with m2x. Now, another thing we should recognize about this formula if we have m2x, we're going to have two m pluses and we're going to have an x2 minus. So there is a slight variation or slight difference here, which is that. For x, we're going to have two electron affinities, Ea1 plus Ea2. If we were using the equation, we'd still put the number in exactly the same way, but this is now going to be a positive number. Uh, as we talked about back in Chapter 3, when we add two electrons to something, that's typically going to be positive overall, uh, en uh, endothermic. So we're going to have a positive number for electron affinity, but we would still treat the numbers exactly the same way. Or, um, you know, If we want to use the equation, we use the equation without any modification. Uh, just when we draw the born haber cycle, things are going to look a little bit different because now we have a lot of endothermic terms. So in this situation here, every term is endothermic except for the lattice energy. So the lattice energy, again, is going to be the gas phase ions, 2m plus, and then x2 minus, combining to form ionic compound. And the only difference here, again, is that this is now the only exothermic step. All the rest of these steps are going to be endothermic, as we'll see. So like I said, the first thing we always do is break it up into the elements. So M2X is going to make two metals. The metal is always a solid. And then one half X2. If we go to the given information, we're told that X2 is a gas. Once again, we're not told anything else. So plus one half X2 gas. And then the next two steps, this is going to be the negative of the delta H of formation, which for this compound is going to be this term here. This is delta H of formation, forming the compounds from the element. Negative 1232, so then we take the negative of that, and it's going to be plus 1232. This won't be drawn to scale, but I'll put all the terms here. And then we get the first thing we do then is we take the metal, and we sublime it, make it a gas, so solid to gas. 
Because we have two metals here, this is going to be 2 times the delta H of sublimation. So we're never going to have a factor in front of delta H of formation, because that always refers to one mole of compound. And we're always starting with one mole of compound. But here we have two metal solid going to two metal gas, so we have to double the sublimation enthalpy. So sublimation enthalpy is this one here. So 2 times that is going to be 662. And then the next thing we're going to do is ionize the metal. So we're going to take our two metals and make two M pluses, which releases two electrons. And again, in this case here, we have two metals going to two M pluses, so we have to double the ionization energy. And we're always going to use the ionization energy for the metal because that's what's losing the electrons. So that's going to be this term here. And that's going to be two times 373. Which is 746. Alright, so we're going to do, we have to double that number as well. And then finally, for the nonmetal, we have to dissociate it. So our 1 half x2 becomes just x. We should keep our states of matter here to not forget about those, but x2 is always a gas. And then we're going to dissociate that 1 half x2 into x. That's going to be one half times the delta H of dissociation, because we have a coefficient of one half in front of x2. So that's going to be, let's see, this term here, x2 going to 2x, this is our delta H of dissociation. We have to take only half of that value because we only have half an equivalent of x2. So this number gets modified to 126. And then finally, the last step is going to be taking these two electrons and adding them to x to make x2 minus. And again, this is our electron affinity for x, but technically it's electron affinity 1 plus electron affinity 2 because we're adding two electrons. So each electron affinity refers to the addition of one electron. And the given information is reported in terms of the sum of the two. Ea1 plus Ea2 is 278. So we're just going to use that number as is because we have one x that we're adding electrons to, so we don't have to modify that. And again, because it's two electrons, that makes it another endothermic step. Um, but the cycle is set up this way, and then once again, we set everything, add everything up and set it equal to zero. So 1232 plus 662 plus 746 plus 126 plus 278. And then we come back on the other side, we have the lattice energy. And then when we solve for lattice energy, we should get a pretty large negative number in this case. We get minus 3044 kilojoules per mole. All right, so that's the Born-Haber cycle, which at least helps us to piece together and understand all the steps. Again, if we want to just use the general equation for lattice energy, it will work in this case because x exists as x2 and it's a gas, so we don't have to worry about any of the extra terms that we might need otherwise. So lattice energy again is going to be the delta H of formation minus m times the delta H of sublimation minus m times the ionization energy for the metal minus n over 2 times the delta H of dissociation for x2 minus n times the electron affinity for x2, which, or sorry, for x, which could be, again, one or two electron affinities, depending on how many electrons we're adding. Same with the ionization energy. If we're, if we're removing more than one electron, this ionization energy term refers to however many electrons we're removing. In this case, it's only one. So we put the numbers in for here. We just put minus 1232. m is going to be 2 in this case, because we have two metals. So it's going to be minus 2 times sublimation enthalpy, which is 331, minus 2 times the ionization energy for the metal, which is 373. N is equal to 1. We have 1 X, so it's going to be minus 1 half times the dissociation, which is 252. And then we have minus N times the electron affinity. We have 1 X, so N is 1. And then the electron affinity term, again, is going to be the sum of the two, 278.
and that will that will give us the same answer. Of minus three thousand forty four. All right, so there's two ways to do it. Use, use the equation or even better, try to work the cycle. All right, so those take a while. There's a lot of steps involved. And again, the best way to do them is to practice them. The rest of these are going to deal with gas laws, which are, in my opinion, a little bit more straightforward. So let's start with this one here, which uh, for some reason we had trouble with. And I think the most popular answer was A for some reason, which uh, reflects the fact that you probably inverted the equation somehow. Um, so here we're dealing with a balloon filled with helium. It has a volume of 1.5 liters at 90.5 kilopascals and 25 degrees Celsius. What will the volume of the balloon be at a pressure of 35 kilopascals if there is no change in temperature? So like I said, for gas law problems like this, where we're changing the conditions, changing one or more of the, the variables of either pressure, volume, number of moles, or temperature, there's a bunch of different equations that relate to those, but we start always with PV equals NRT. And then we put everything that's constant on one side. So this is the trick that we're always going to use to drive whatever equation we're using. So in this case, we're, we're not told anything about the number of moles, and it's a balloon. So if we assume the balloon is not leaking, number of moles is constant. There's no change in temperature. So temperature is constant. So even though we're given the temperature of 25 degrees Celsius, we don't even need to worry about that because it's not changing. We only need to worry about the variables that are changing. But what we notice is that the pressure and the volume are changing. So the volume is initially 1.5 liters, and the pressure is 90.5 kilopascals. And we want to know what's the volume at the new pressure of 35 kilopascals. All right, so we're going to put everything that's constant on one side. That's just going to be NRT. So PV equals NRT, which is equal to a constant. So the only variables that are changing are pressure and volume. So we're just going to use Boyle's law. P1V1 equals P2V2. So those are the variables that are changing. We set the initial and final equal to each other. We're solving for the final volume, V2. So it's going to be... P1, V1 over P2. And now we just start plugging in numbers. And the other nice thing about doing it this way is that we don't have to worry about units because we just have a ratio of two pressures. So as long as the two have the same units, we can use whatever we want. So we can use kilopascals directly. So the initial pressure is 90.5 kPa, which is kilopascals. The initial volume is 1.50 liters. And then the final pressure, again, in kilopascals is given to us as 35. So we don't have to change those units at all. Kilopascals divide out, and we're left with a volume in liters, which should come out to choice E, 3.88 liters. All right, so choice E is the correct one. Many of you had A, which uh, I think would have been if you switched P1 and P2 or something like that. So. Um, Make sure that we always start with P equals NRT, and that's going to derive the correct form of the equation where pressure and volume are inversely related. We should also check if our answer makes sense. We, we you know, introduced the concepts very early on that pressure and volume are inversely related. So if the pressure is going down, the volume should go up, and we see that this answer is, in fact, bigger than the initial volume of 1.5. All right. Um, this question is, is very similar in concept. We're, again, dealing with changing the you know parameters for an ideal gas and we want to know how that ref how that uh, affects one of the other parameters but here it's just I think what got a lot of us was the wording so based on the answers that were most popular I think most of you did this correctly um, it was just the wording of the answer choices we got tripped up on a little bit so here we have a one mole of an ideal gas the temperature changes from 305 Kelvin to 32 degrees Celsius and the pressure changes from two atmospheres to 101 kilopascals so the first thing is that the units are a little bit annoying here because we need everything to be in the same units if we're going to use this. But first, let's figure out what form of the equation we're going to use. So in this case, we have one mole of an ideal gas. We don't even really need that number because it's constant. We're not changing the number the amount of gas. But we're changing, in this case, the temperature and the pressure. And we want to know how the volume responds to that. So temperature, so everything but number of moles is changing. So PV over T is equal to NR, which is going to be constant in this case. So all of these are changing, pressure, volume, and temperature. So we're going to have P 
P1V1 over T1 equals P2V2 over T2. Now in this case we're looking for the volumes and we're not told the initial volumes so we can't say exactly what they are but really what we're looking for is a ratio of the volume. So what is going to be V2 over V1? The final volume divided by the initial volume we want to know what's the relationship between those. So we can solve for that ratio and we get P1 T2 over P2 T1. So it's going to be a ratio of P1 over P2 times the ratio of T2 over T1. And that will give us the ratio of the two volumes at the end at the beginning. So we're not told the exact volume, so we can't solve for it, but we can look at the relative um, ratios of the two volumes, again, using this equation and solving for that ratio. So if we start putting in numbers here, we need to have them in the right units. Um, it doesn't matter which units we use as long as temperature has to be in Kelvin. That one does matter, but then the pressure can be whatever we want. So for temperature, we have 305 Kelvin to 32 degrees Celsius. So T1 is 305 Kelvin, T2 is 35, or sorry, 32 degrees Celsius, so we add 273 to that, and that's also 305 Kelvin. So it turns out the temperature is also not changing, T1 equals T2. So we could have just left these two terms out because T2 over T1 is going to be 1, so it's not going to affect our ratio. So really we just need the ratio of the pressures. P1 starts at 2 atmospheres, and then P2 is going to be 101 kilopascals, which we have to convert to atmospheres. This is not the most common pressure unit, but 1 atmosphere is 101 kilopascals. You know, do that in class. So 101 kilopascals is equal to 1 atmosphere. So the two pressures are different. So it's going to be V2 over V1 is going to be 2 atmospheres, which is P1, divided by 1 atmosphere, which is P2, which equals 2. So that means the second volume is double the first volume. And here's where the terminology of the answer choices comes into play. So the volume is increasing, so we can get rid of choice B and choice E because the volume is increasing uh, and choice C which also is decreasing. So the only two choices are now are A and D and we know the volume is increasing because the ratio of V2 to V1 is 2 is greater than 1. But if the volumes are du if the volume is doubling does that mean it's increasing by 200% or increasing by 100%? This means it's increasing by 100%. Or in other words V2 is equal to 2 times V1 which is equal to V1 plus V1. So we're taking our initial volume and we're increasing it by 100% of the initial volume. So when we, whenever we double something, that means an increase of 100%, increasing by 100%. So the wording of this one was a little bit strange, and that, I think, threw a lot of you off. But the correct way to, to state that is that the volume is increasing by 100%. If it was increasing by 200%, that would mean that you're tripling the volume because you're taking the initial V1 and adding twice V1 to that to get a final volume of three times the initial for an increase of 100%, it's going to be, again, V1 plus V1 is equal to 2 V1. Alright, so that was the probably the confusing part of that one, but again, it's using the ideal gas equation, deriving a new form of the equation that only involves the variable that are changing. Alright, the next problem here deals with uh, pressure measurement. So I introduced this in class, and there was one problem or a couple problems in the homework that dealt with this. Um, so we have a barometric pressure of 0.956 atmospheres when the mercury level in an open-end manometer connected to a flask of gas was 132 millimeters mercury higher on the side open to the atmosphere than on the flask side. What was the pressure of the gas flask in Tor? All right, so there's a lot going on here. And, and basically what we have to do is sketch the apparatus. That's the hint that we're given. So we have a bulb of gas, and then remember that in a manometer you have sort of this U sh shape here, so you have a U shaped uh, system here with mercury inside of it, and then in an open end manometer, which is what we have here, the atmospheric pressure is pushing down on one side, 
then the gas pressure is going to be pushing up on the other side. So if you look at this, it says that the the pressure was, or sorry, the height of the mercury was 132 millimeters higher on the side open to the atmosphere. So that means it kind of looks like this. It's higher over here than over here. So our U shape looks kind of like this, and then this difference in height here is 132 millimeters. All right, so the, the key point here is that, is this pressure gonna be higher or lower than atmospheric pressure? If the, if the mercury column is lower on the side of the gas, that means the gas pressure is higher because that means the gas is pushing down harder than atmosphere, so that distorts it in this direction. So what that means is that the pressure of our gas is going to be atmospheric pressure plus this difference in height delta H because in this case, it's the pressure of the gas is higher than atmospheric pressure by that much. All right, so what we have to do now is put the numbers in. So atmospheric pressure is 0.956 atmospheres. We want uh, the pressure of the gas in tor. So we, we want the pressure in tor. So the barometric pressure is gonna be the atmospheric pressure, 0 0.956 atmospheres times 760 tor over one atmosphere. So our atmospheric pressure is 726.56 torr. And then delta H, which is millimeters of mercury, remember that. Delta H is 132 millimeters of mercury, which equals 132 torr. This torr millimeter of mercury is our equivalent, so we add that to this. And so the pressure is gonna finally come out to 828.56 torr, entered to two decimal places as the problem instructs us to. All right, so we're measuring pressure. If we have an open-end manometer, it's measuring the pressure relative to atmospheric pressure. And if the side of the mercury column is lower on the side of the gas or higher on the side of the atmosphere, that means that the gas pressure is higher than atmospheric pressure by that amount. All right, so sketching out is really helpful in this situation. It helps us decide whether we add or subtract delta H. Because if the atmosphere pressure was higher than the gas pressure, in other words, if the manometer was shifted in the other way, we have to subtract delta H. All right, this next question is a conceptual question about the ideal gas law, which wants to know what is the best relationship between the volume of a gas and its Celsius temperature, other factors remaining constant. So this is very similar to the bonus quiz question that I gave you on Friday, where we're looking at the relationship between two variables and whether they follow a linear or nonlinear um, path, whether the slope is positive or negative, and so on. So starting with the ideal gas equation, PV equals nRT, the ones that we're comparing are volume and temperature. Volume on the y-axis, temperature on the x-axis, so we're gonna move those to opposite sides. So volume is gonna be nR over P times the temperature. Remember that these are all constant if we pull this problem. So volume is equal to some constant K times the temperature. So the two are linear, linearly related with a positive slope, we know that. But here we have temperature in Celsius. So this ideal gas equation, remember that temperature has to be in Kelvin. So this works if the temperature is in Kelvin. If we want it in Celsius, remember that the temperature in Kelvin is equal to the temperature in Celsius plus 273. So if we make that substitution, volume is equal to some constant times the temperature in Celsius plus 273. And this looks a lot like a Y equals MX plus B type equation where we have our Y variable V, our X variable is temperature in Celsius with some constant attached to it, and then we have a, a, a constant that's intercept which is K times 273. So the one that works best is gonna be this one here, B, which is a straight line with a positive slope and a non-zero intercept. So B is gonna be the correct answer for this one. All right, so choice C would work if we were in Kelvin where there's no intercept, but because we are, we're using temperature in Celsius, we have to add on this 273 to the temperature term that gives us a non-zero Y intercept. All right, and the rest of those are either have negative slopes and we'll have, never have a negative slope for an ideal gas relationship because all the variables are, are positive and then choice D is nonlinear and, and E as well. So we have two nonlinear choices as well. These are clearly 
linear relationships. Okay, so that was sort of a, a recap of our bonus quiz. Gets us thinking about you know the relationships between these and how they relate then to the equations uh, in a y-x type plot. All right, the next two here we're going to close out with two other concepts related to the ideal gas law. The first one is gas stoichiometry. So we want to know how many liters of hydrogen gas can be produced at 18 degrees Celsius and 725 millimeters of mercury when 3.08 grams of lithium reacts with excess water. So when we're doing gas stoichiometry problems, there's typically two steps involved. We're going to be calculating number of moles for either one of the reactions or the products, and then we're going to be relating that to some other term using the ideal gas equation. So the first thing we have to do is balance the equation. This is a redox reaction, so we could use the method of oxidation numbers to balance this, but this one's fairly simple, I think, to balance. So if we put coefficients of 2 in front of water and lithium hydroxide, that should balance that, and we have to have a coefficient of 2 in front of lithium. So this one balances fairly simply. If we wanted to use the oxidation number approach, we could. So I encourage you to review that if you had trouble balancing this. But we just have to make sure that we have these coefficients correct. Two in front of lithium, two in front of water, two in front of the product. So we're looking for the volume of hydrogen gas. So we need to find the moles of hydrogen first, and we're told how much lithium is reacting. So the first step of this is just a stoichiometry problem where we're going to look for the moles of H2 that are formed. So we're told that lithium is reacting with excess water, so this is our limiting reactant. So we have 3.08 grams of lithium. We can convert that to moles using the molar mass. The atomic mass of lithium from the periodic table is 6.94. So we use 6.94 grams per mole. So grams cancel out. That gives us moles of lithium. And now we want to find moles of hydrogen. So here's where the mole ratios and the balance equation are important. So we're going to form one mole of H2 for every two moles of lithium. And so when we multiply that across, we get the moles of H2 is going to be 0 0.221, sorry, 222. So we have 0 0.222 moles of H2, and we're looking for how many liters of hydrogen can be produced. So from there, we're going to use PV equals nRT, and we're trying to find the volume, which is going to be nRT divided by the pressure. If we're using the ideal gas equation with the value of R, we have to make sure the units are correct. So the temperature needs to be in, in Kelvin, so we're told that the temperature is 18 degrees Celsius. We have to add 273 to that. That's 291 Kelvin. And then the pressure needs to be in atmospheres. So pressure is going to be 725 millimeters of mercury times one atmosphere over 760 millimeters of mercury. And millimeters of mercury and tor are related, and there's one atmosphere per 760 of those, so the pressure in atmospheres is going to be 0.954. Alright, so when we're using the ideal gas equation, we need to have the units correct. So now we put these numbers in, and we're going to get 0.222 moles, that's the number of moles we found from the stoichiometry calculation. The universal gas constant, which is 0.0821 liter atmospheres per k mole. And then the temperature is 291 Kelvin. We had to have that in Kelvin. And then finally, when we put the pressure in of 0 0.954 atmospheres. So when we do the computation, let's see what we get. We get 5.56 liters. All right, so this is one of those problems where we had um, variable inputs. So you could have had different numbers in this. I'm trying to erase this and take more of that. 5.56 liters. So make sure you can read that. All right, so 5.56 liters is going to be the, the volume that we get. And you could have gotten a different number because this one, the, the mass input was, was variable. Um, but again, it's a stoichiometry problem, so we're going to use stoichiometry to find something about moles, and we use the ideal gas equation to relate the number of moles to other variables, pressure, volume, and temperature. 
All right, and then finally, the last one here is another two-part problem, where which involves a bit of review from Chapter 4. Um, here we have a gaseous compound that's 30.4% 30 nitrogen and 69.6% .6 oxygen by mass. A 5.25 gram sample of the gas occupies a volume of 1.00 liter and observes a pressure of 1.26 atmospheres at minus 4 degrees Celsius. Which of the following is its molecular formula? All right, so there's two steps to this problem. Remember that in the past when we first talked about uh, determining molecular formulas, if we want to determine the molecular formula from the mass percents that we're given, we need two things. We need the empirical formula, which we can get directly from the mass percents. And then the second thing we need is the molar mass, which we, we can then relate to the empirical mass and figure out what the molecular formula is from that. So we need these two pieces of information. The first one we're going to get using the mass percent. And the second one we're going to get using the ideal gas equation, using the variation of that that deals with the density of the gas. So first let's get the empirical formula. So for the empirical formula, remember that we have mass percents, so we assume 100 grams. So we're going to get the moles of each, sub, uh, of each element, nitrogen and oxygen. So we, we assume 30.4 grams of nitrogen. We use the atomic mass of nitrogen, and that's going to give us the moles of nitrogen, divide. So we get 2.17 moles of nitrogen, and then for oxygen we do the same thing. We have 69.6 grams of oxygen, if we're assuming 100 grams of compound. And then the molar mass or atomic mass of oxygen is 16.0. So we get 4.35 moles of oxygen. So our empirical formula is going to be N2.17 O4.35. We divide both of those by the smaller one, which is 2.17. And we should get NO2. All right, so that's our empirical formula. That's step one. We want to know what the molecular formula is, which again can be any multiple of NO2. So now here's where we're going to use the ideal gas equation to find the molar mass. So remember that we have this variation of the ideal gas equation that deals with density. So density is equal to mass divided by volume, which is going to be equal to the pressure times the molar mass divided by RT. All right, so this is derived directly from ideal gas equation and deals with the density. And so now we can put the numbers in. We have the mass and the volume. We have the pressure and the temperature. So mass is 5.25 grams, and the volume is 1.00 liters. So 5.25 grams divided by 1.00 liters is going to be equal to the pressure, which is 1.26 atmospheres. times the molar mass, which is our unknown in this case, divided by RT. And the temperature is minus 4 degrees Celsius. If you have to convert to Kelvin, it's going to be 69 Kelvin. So when we solve for molar mass, which I abbreviated MW here, We get 5.25. We get 92.0 grams per mole. All right, so that's the molar mass. We have to add one more page to finish this off. All right, so we'll add another page. We have the empirical formula and the molar mass, and then we have one last step to get the molecular formula. So for this, we have to find the empirical mass. For NO2, which is going to be 14.01. That's nitrogen plus 2 times 16 for oxygen. So the empirical mass is 46. 46.0 and then finally remember that we take the molar mass and we divide by the empirical mass 
So our molar mass we found up here was 92. Our empirical mass is 46. And we get a factor of 2. So that means our molecular formula is a factor of 2 times our empirical formula. So it's going to be NO2 is the empirical formula. We double that to get the molecular formula, and we get N2O4, right, which has the correct molar mass of 92, so that's going to give us answer choice D is the correct one. Now, for this part here where we found the molar mass, there is a slightly different way we could do it, because if we remember that molar mass is grams per mole, the other way we could do it is we're given the grams 5.25, we could have used the ideal gas equation, PV equals NRT, to find the, number of, find the number of moles because we have the pressure, we have the volume, we have the temperature, so we can find the number of moles that way and then just divide the two. So there's a couple of different ways of getting this molar mass. The density equation is the most direct way of doing that, um, but we could have thought about it a slightly different way. But either way, you have to use ideal gas equation to help you find the molar mass, but you then relate to the empirical mass to find what the correct molecular formula is. All right, that takes us to the end. Um, that was kind of a long one because uh, we had to deal with those lattice energy problems, which are quite involved. Um, the gas law stuff, though, we didn't do too bad on overall, just a few things to, to brush up there. And we'll have another homework next week that deals with more aspects of gas chemistry.